Excellencies and ambassadors, distinguished guests and delegates. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Fatima, currently working as a research assistant here at Peeps. Today, I welcome you all to the Peeps Roundtable on Emerging Security Challenges, South Asian Security Landscape. The moderator for today's roundtable is Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Jodhuri, Distinguished Fellow Peeps. And the speakers of today's roundtable are Brigadier General Shahidul Anam Khan, former associate editor, The Daily Star, Dr. Niloy Ronjun Vishash, associate professor, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, and Ms. Farzana Mannan, associate professor, Department of International Relations, Jahangirnagar University. Now, I would like to request the moderator to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fatima. Uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to you. Uh, recovering from the holidays, I hope. Uh, I'm sorry we, we're starting a, a bit late because uh, I was told because of heavy traffic, some of us were held up, and uh, so I'll cut to the chase uh, straight away. The topic for the discussion today, as you're aware, is emerging security challenges. South Asian security landscape. And now uh, the classical Greeks used to believe that before you uh, deliberate on anything, you would want to define your terms. Uh, the two terms today, relevant terms today, that uh, uh, are, are obvious. I mean, one is, of course, uh, South Asia, and the other is, uh, is security. Uh, now, uh, South Asia is uh, easy to define. It's uh, by if we mean uh, the vast landmass between the Middle East and Southeast Asia on the edge of the Indian Ocean, comprising the states of Afghanistan, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Maldives, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. But what is security? Now, security is a core value of human life. To be secure is to be free from the worries of disturbance, disturbances caused by danger or fear. The desire for security is a defensive and a self-protecting response to the fact or threat of harm from exogenous or, or external factors, like human or natural, natural. Now, there are four key assumptions underlying the, the idea of security. One, security of what? Two, from what? Three, for what? And four, by what means? There is today a broad consensus in the academic community that different kinds of security are too serious and complex to be approached in traditional ways, that is within the paradigm of nation states. This is largely because non-state actors have also become key uh, to effective response. Now, security is a unifying component in each of the global issues in the world today. For that reason, it is a central theme of international relations. It is also a contested concept that has occupied minds for thousands of years. The central debate is whether security should be about protecting the state or the individual or both. Extending that, another question emerges as to who uh, or what should provide security. For example, should this power or responsibility resides with the states, or should it be relegated whole or in part to international organizations? When attempting to drop an internationally recognized framework to respond to these questions, such questions, there may be embedded unavoidable challenges to the concept of sovereignty. Two separate examples from two separate uh, uh, perspectives are evident 
one say from the political perspective, uh, uh, take the concept of responsibility to protect, which has featured in some of our BIPs uh, discussions earlier in recent times. And from non-traditional security lens, say the role of the World Health Organization during the COVID pandemic. This merits focus as sovereignty is viewed as the bedrock of the global system. It also indicates the gradual evolution of sovereignty words, inspired by changing definitions, and this is very important, changing definitions of both the terms and concepts of sovereignty and security. Back then to security, which is what our discussion today is mainly about. Yes, security may be about forms and borders, but it can also be about bodies as well. By stressing the individual level, as opposed to state level, the interpretation is referred to as human security. Now, the central debate within defining uh, security, therefore, is one that has its origin, is its levels of analysis issue. Now, as all students of international relations should be aware, the application of levels of analysis is a key yardstick in the examination or understanding of any problem. Any discussion on South Asia must be placed against a milieu of the wider global matrix. We are amid a changing world. Old paradigms of international relations are shifting. New global powers, like China, and in many ways India, are emerging. Tensions in parts of the world, such as in the Ukraine or the Sudan, are rising. Some past strains as relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia are calming. Traditional alliances, such as NATO, are transforming. New ones, such as AUKUS and Quad, may be forming across the world. Age-old age linkages are altering. But amidst all this, there is one phenomenon that is stubbornly persisting. I refer to the sad state of intramural relationship within South Asia. The regional organization SAR has become totally inactive, mainly due to uh, existing rivalry between the two major protagonists, which is of course India and Pakistan. Although the South Asian entity lacks, lacks coherence, this does not mean it lacks importance or even clout. First, politically and economically, the countries have been, have been significant global players. The region includes uh, uh, India, which is uh, <clears throat> the fastest growing economy in the world. Second, secondly, the demographic dividend of all South Asian countries has given them an advantage over many larger economies. Their youth are leading the march to modernity, taking advantage of new technologies. Third, the huge and successful South Asian diaspora and also persons of South Asian origin are playing a major role in global politics, economics, and thought leadership. So, while South Asian regionalization may be weak, it is not weak as a region. It's almost, it is almost a motherhood expression, uh, a statement which none can contradict that greater regional cooperation will enhance South Asia's uh, global importance and attract international attention. This will contribute to its prosperity and bring benefits to all countries. The problem, however, is how this collaboration can be engendered. I shall not seek to steal this panelist's thunder, and we will look to the stellar group that we have around us today, around this table, of fine intellect that we have to provide some of the answers. So we shall now turn to them, and we shall do so in the following order. What I had encouraged them to do earlier, 
uh, was sort of to focus on certain, in order to bring some kind of an order to the discussions on, uh, on some broad parameters. Uh, among the speakers, we have, for instance, today, uh, Dr. Niloy Ranjan Bissas, who is an associate professor of the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Ms. Farzana Manan, she's associate professor, Department of International Relations, Jangan Nagar University. And Brigadier General retired Shahidul Anam Khan, who is a former associate editor of the Daily Star. So what... Uh, uh, Professor uh, Professor Biswas or Dr. Biswas will do is sort of focus on on the broad parameters, general uh, 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 ideas with regard to the to the subject in hand. Uh, uh, Ms. Farzana Manan will uh, will focus on non-traditional threats, and uh, and uh, uh, Brigadier uh, Anam will will fo uh, will, will uh, uh, be mainly base his remarks on the traditional aspects of, of security. So with these few words, uh, or these words, <laughs> weren't quite few, uh, I will hand over the microphone, invite uh, uh, Professor Niloy Ranjan Bissas. Uh, and uh, Niloy, you have the floor. Do you have a microphone yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. microphone. Okay. Um, Right. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to speak um, today in the morning, particularly after a very um, interesting vacation that we have. And um, the topic that I was suggested by Iftegasar is to, to discuss and set a broad parameter on the geostrategic implications under, um, um, you know, today's um, title, which is Emerging Security Challenges, the South Asian Landscape. So if I understand correctly, I have 15 minutes roughly or? Well, roughly 15, roughly 15 minutes. Roughly 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll try to, yeah, try to, try to um, give a broad overview of my understanding of the geostrategic significance of the region. And we all can understand, uh, particularly when we talk about geostrategy, it falls into a little bit of interdisciplinary understanding of the geopolitical importance. You can also consider the economic issues. But conventionally, when we think about strategy, we have a, a kind of an imaginary uh, construction of uh, of defense, uh, conventional security, and um, more hardcore security understanding and things like that. Now, nevertheless, in the post-Cold War era, we have, and the scholars particularly in the broader international relations aspect, has redefined the understanding of geostrategy as well. So let us see if we um, can also incorporate some of these uh, conceptual or theoretical understanding in redefining uh, the construction of geostrategic significance of South Asia particularly in the 21st century. Now, um, you know, if we if we try to define South Asia in the in the contemporary context, and uh, you know, if we just move beyond the understanding of the land-based construction of the of the region, I think most importantly, you know, we can we can provide the names uh, and 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 term uh, these in a various ways, and the geographical boundaries of South Asia has been reconstructed. It cannot just be only the six or seven countries or eight countries, perhaps, and the land-based boundaries that has been constructed during the Cold War era. And now we can also understand that how maritime-based construction of the understanding of the region is also very significant when we have been using the terms um, in the Pacific uh, and also Indian Ocean, this rising prominence of the oceans in understanding the geography and geostrategy has also been very interesting. So therefore, I think in understanding the regional, the significance of the region itself, it is important for us to understand that what do we incorporate or include or exclude to to construct a strategic imaginary of this region. Or many would perhaps say that whether we are constructing a meta region, which is not a region that we try to understand in the context of 80s, when a regional institution tried to define the region. And therefore, coming you know, after the two decades of the 21st century, we can probably understand if we do not, if we want to believe or not, that a particular institution cannot define a region itself. So, of course, I'm talking about SARC and our understanding of the region through the institution. So, the institution itself has devolved and the understanding of the region and its significance, strategic significance has been devolved as well. So, I have a few questions which obviously I do not have the exact answers thanks to my discipline, which is IR. We do not answer concretely or broadly social sciences and we confuse people more uh, rather than provide a single answer like which 
physics or mathematics. Um, so the, the questions are quite interesting as well, and perhaps some of you have better answers than me. First of all, how do we how do we reconstruct this strategic imaginary of the region called South Asia? So what are the basic or what are the major important points? First of all, I think we all can understand that the to understand the, the geopolitical or geostrategic imaginary of this region, or I perhaps would better comfort, be, be comfortable to, un, to identify this as a meta region, uh, because it's still kind of evolving, uh, that heterogeneity of this region. This region is heterogeneous. There are, of course, you know, complementarities, commonalities, and you know, in culture, language. But this is, this is also a very heterogeneous region. This region has more than 25% of the population uh, of the world. Uh, there are countries which are economically very significant. There are countries which have been suffering on various uh, security, insecurity dilemmas, whether it is intra or inter in nature. There are, this is a you know, geographically small region, but you know, in terms of population, as I have mentioned, it, it hosts more than 25% of the population. It also has two major nuclear powers that we have to understand. So there is an interesting consonance and dissonance factors which is evolving from the same set of variables, which is, again, hardcore securities and there are soft core issues. And when we talk about soft core issues, I have very uh, eminent colleagues who will be discussing that more in details, but you know, climate change, food securities, pandemic that we have been tackling quite efficiently, to my opinion, are some of the very significant non-traditional factors. But both these factors, quite interestingly, and um, intermittently created very interesting consonants where we have seen collaborations between the countries, but at the same time, we have seen that they have also created dissonance. Therefore, like a single factor, for example, if it can be the uh, cooperation regarding climate change or cooperation during the pandemic between the South Asian countries, we have seen that, yes, there were initiatives between the countries. And again, we have seen that how countries have not really cooperated with each other and have been very selective in cooperating with each other during the pandemic time to provide support for the other countries. Now, has that impacted on uh, you know the regional collaboration or cooperation and what kind of image does it provide to the region at the same time i think you know post cold war era and particularly after 2001 when the quote unquote global war on terror started uh, after 9 11 the the, the, there, is, there is a revival of the geopolitical prominence of this region um, and which is obviously as part of the global war on terror most of the important countries, particularly India and Pakistan, both were engaged with United States and the allied countries, and that has kind of redefined the geostrategic significance. So when we talk about the geostrategic significance, if we start with 2010 onwards, I think this will be a mistake. I think it should be after 2001, and particularly with South Asia's participation directly or indirectly in the global war on terror. Not only because that South Asia is considered to be one of the significant reasons and many scholars have identified as quote unquote breeding ground of terrorism, which I personally do not believe, but it has a significant kind of like presence in when we talk about violent extremism and counter violent extremism. And still it is quite significant in that context. So the geopolitical prominence uh, has some of these important factors on this context. Now there are of course endogenous and Exogenous factors, so like internal and external factors. So when we talk about internal factors, most of the countries have suffered their own internal intrastate conflicts, civil wars, and other issues. And there are countries which have also uh, fought uh, with each other before as well. I think the last conflict, like the quote-unquote war uh, we had between India and Pakistan, was in 1998. Immediately after the uh, explosion, our you know self-declaration of uh, um, um, both the countries countries um, as the nuclear power. So it also kind of um, detest or uh, not validate that two nuclear powers do not fight with each other. And we, we give that example quite significantly. Many would probably, uh, many would probably uh, discourage that, you know, whether the idea of deterrence is significantly tested in South Asia uh, when we talk about nuclear deterrence or not. There might be difference of understanding regarding the war uh, uh, of 1998 uh, and the progresses in the nuclear proliferation so far as now. But both these countries, in fact, post 1998, 1998 has also complied except NPT and CTBT with the other kind of non-formal and bilateral um, you know, non-proliferation 
um, um, uh, regimes, except NPT and CTVT, as I've mentioned. So some of these issues are quite significant that we need to really understand uh, when we talk about South Asia's geostrategic significance. And as I've told, that most of these factors, if you interpret it in one way, will probably show you that there are consonances because we have avoided significant strategic disasters, except, you know, there are, of course, border clashes. Uh, and there are other tensions regarding, um, in a, in a mostly concentrating on the borders and also various on the non-traditional securities. But we have survived without getting engaged into big uh, kind of like, you know, quote unquote, conventionary conf conventional conflicts in that sense. And particularly when you see the examples that would not spare Europe now at this moment that there are wars for what we, um, particularly in the IR, would say that, uh, you know, um, uh, there'll be no wars in future. This very uh, dictum of 1990s, or particularly post-Cold War, has been proven wrong. Now, the second question is, what transformation do we see in South Asia? Um, there is one big argument, which is um, that has it uh, transformed into Indocentric? or Indo-Pacific centric. I think this is the biggest uh, kind of like, you know, discussion or debate at this moment, particularly. Now, now it depends on how you answer whether it is Indo-centric, Indo-Pacific. I'm sure that you all are very much informed and aware how Asia-Pacific vocabulary has been transformed into Indo-Pacific. So I'll not go into that details. But I think we need to also, I think if you really would like to understand the, the, the geostrategic significance, we need to redefine the, the Indian Ocean and Indocentricity coming out of the, uh, the nation state structure of India. Because historically, the Indocentricity of this region is quite prominent. Now, of course, after the Second World War, during the Cold War, and even after the, some periods of the of, of the post-Cold War era, Pacific got importance. Now, there are scholars, of course, they also would like to identify that the current formation of the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, construction or strategic imagery has also targeted to Pacific, particularly, you know, when we talk about, you know, China's role in South, South China Sea or, um, you know, particularly targeting Taiwan. But there are significant uh, studies and scholars who also are look would like to identify that this idea of concentration regarding Indian Ocean is not only about a particular country or countries or based on state-centric ideas of international relations or geopolitics. It's more about concentrating or a transformation from the land-based understanding of a particular region or confluence of region to a more uh, maritime-based uh, collaborations and cooperations, which is, I think, quite interesting. Of course, there are asymmetrism in the region. We can all understand that. I can take, like, I can, we can talk about, like, 100 examples. But it is also important to understand that these asymmetrism does not always lead to, as I have mentioned a little bit earlier, like, a lot of dissonance or conventionally strategic disasters in the region. We have survived our asymmetrism and, you know, tried to, over the period of time, sometimes at least kind of enjoyed that asymmetric nature as well. Now, what what are the, I mean, you know, there are, there are various ex exogenous factors. Are all exogenous factors confluenced or converged on when we talk about South Asia? Obviously not. This is not possible. This has never been possible in any other region as well. So, of course, there are extra regional powers who are significantly present on trade, uh, um, um, defense, uh, social development, non-traditional security, and various other factors. We need to remember that we have extended the region in both North and South, particularly when I've uh, included Afghanistan as part of South Asia and also have not officially included Myanmar, but Myanmar is a very significant gateway when we talk about our activist or our, um, you know, locust policies and our active collaboration with uh, Southeast Asian nations. So both these countries have faced significant troubles and experienced significant presence of the extra-regional actors. And still there are important, particularly when we talk about Afghanistan, there are multiplicity of relationship between the powers, both extra-regional powers and within the region powers. Now, you know, what, what, what does it uh, lay to, uh, I mean, what does it suggest that how do we um, resolve? I'll take probably three. Yeah, yeah, minutes. of course. Sure. So, um, so are we defining this relationship as 
uh, when we talk about the presence of the extra regional powers and their confluence or their divergences in terms of uh, um, relationship with with the, with the regional countries, is this following a containment culture or is it a strategic competition? I think it may sound like a little bit of play of words, but again, in the IR scholarship, you can take either of or even a different word to explain that relationship. Now, containment is of course a Cold War terminology, and we can understand, you know, we we still use that word balancing, we still use the word, for example, um, uh, hedging, bandwagoning, but I'm very much personally opposed to this kind of Cold War terminology to explain the relationship of the contemporary time. And I have my own logics, which will probably take a bit of time, but I'll stick to not using the term containment, which is still quite significantly used to explain the Indo-Pacific, the objective of Indo-Pacific, or even the Belt and Road initiatives led by China. But more, I think, to my opinion, it is more you know, convenient to, to design the strategic competitions between the countries, not to exactly contain the way how during the Cold War period the international relations were explained by the significant superpower. Now, you can say that, well, you know, you are also using a different word <laughs> to explain probably the same thing. But I would say probably not, and I have my own evidence. The reason is this world is no more a bipolar world, not even a tripolar world. This is a very complex multipolar world, and there are significant regional countries who have both hardcore, uh, uh, I, I mean, I mean, who are who are doing really well in the hardcore security matters. If you look at either SIPRI uh, statistics or even glo global firepower statistics, and at the same time also doing very good in the non-traditional security or human development actors. So what does it lead to, um, whether it is a strategic competition or even if you are really fascinated about the term containment and we are trapped or things like that, we means like when we talk about countries like Bangladesh, I think, no, this is not the case. Now, the strategic significance of this region has led to provide strategic autonomy to some countries apart from the conventionally powerful ones, which is India and Pakistan. Now, why I'm saying so? Because now I will try. I will take probably 30 seconds to explain that the strategic autonomy for Bangladesh is very significant, and that is also an outcome of the contemporary strategic imagination or reconstruction of the imaginary of the region. Now, I'm sure that you all know about Matarbari deep support. We have been discussing about that in the very recent times, particularly Honorable Prime Minister's visit to Japan. and. Uh, just before that, you know, Bangladesh has um, published its outlook, which will probably be, dis you know, uh, detailed in future time. But this is very important, and you know, there are a lot of stories and conspiracies and different versions that how a deep sea port will be utilized or not, you know, who will be the bigger beneficiaries when we talk about the involvement and engagement of our extra regional powers and international <coughs> development partners. But I think this is going to be a very important regional trade hub no matter what, how that will be literally used, I think we can exclude that discussion because even if we utilize the Matarbari uh, Moheshkali integrated uh, development platform or uh, project which is planned for the next 50 years onwards, it will be utilized by all the extra regional powers, not at the cost of, but in collaboration with the development or uh, you know uh, maximization of the national interest of bangladesh as a regional nation because i personally believe and many other scholars do so as well which is uh, you know there are not only two regional nations in south asia the other nations are improving as well and there might be confluence of other region that does not necessarily mean that all eight countries will confluence together when we talk about south asia there can be four countries go together we have very interesting examples of bbin and you might have your own reservations but i Think these are still very interesting, including BIMSTEC, including other sub regional or regional initiatives which must be moved on in collaboration with the regional other countries and also international development partners. So, coming back to my last point, which is when we talk about strategic region or strategic significance, I think it's more important to kind of revisit and look back to our in in the academic world, what we call the ontological perspective. If we really look back, if we really stay to our uh, 
or kind of like reconstruct our own imaginations in the very Cold War perspective of containment, bandwagoning, hedging, balancing, then I think we are missing out the definition or redefinition of strategic balancing. So strategic balancing is important, but it doesn't mean that we have to be in one block or anyone in South Asia has to be in one block. India, I think, is the fascinating example in this region which have very interestingly balanced this relationship in, in forward. So not only India and there are other countries as well which are doing that or you know, doing the strategic balancing, maximizing their own national interest along with their own um, you know, uh, resources that they have, which I think is very important. This is turning into a, South Asia is turning into a bigger region, obviously not through geography, we can all understand, we are not capturing another lands, we are not <laughs> historically in that nature, it's a land of um, you know, more pacifism, to my opinion, of course there are two nuclear powers, I might be contested to that as well. But I think this is very important for us to understand that you know, we, have, we have produced and interesting examples of connectivities. And these connectivities doesn't only mean about the infrastructural connectivity. And that has also very significant political connotations that can be defined differently by different countries. And as I have told that it is not only about that whether eight countries will, will agree to a certain point and then it's only South Asian. I think we have redefined and passed through that. But the strategic imaginary of this region, which I personally think is more a meta region, I think gives us an understanding uh, that, uh, that we need to deal with so many issues. And particularly, I'd like to finish with the understanding uh, that this is an age of Anthropocene. And particularly when we talk about even uh, the strategic uh, issues or significance of this region, I think we need to understand that, uh, that the climate change will be made cluster it to a non-traditional security, but it will definitely, definitely grasp the entire understanding of the security, whether it is defense or non-defense or matter. Strategic significance of this region, we have to keep in mind, this is an age of Anthropocene, and if we not yet kind of reconfigure our own ideas or what ontological understanding about the regional significance of this region, in line with that, we might miss a significant um, generation in future and do not leave anything about it. So that should be the basis of cooperation in future as well. So that was probably my two cents positive note to finish that apart from the bigger issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nilay. It was certainly more than worth two, two cents. Uh, you, you, you drew uh, the parameters very well, I thought, I mean, of, uh, uh, and redefining as, the, uh, as uh, South Asia as a meta region. Uh, uh, just a couple of footnotes. I mean, just to uh, 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 sort of back up your your thesis uh, there is i think in in a change in the behavior pattern of of the countries vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world in some ways time was when south asia came into existence as sovereign states um, in, in after 47 there was the asymmetries existed and the way the country sought to make up for the asymmetries in other words make up for the power gap between themselves, like India and Pakistan, for instance, led them to interact more with the rest of the world. Like Pakistan turned to CENTO, CETO, etc., extra extra regional powers in order to make up the power gap uh, uh, with India. So the countries became very linked to the uh, to the outside world. Of course, everyone was a most of us were members of the Commonwealth, which by by definition linked us to the rest of the world. But uh, we became, we were a part of the global Cold War, etc. Then there was this period of this non-alignment, I think, where each country, at least at a stated level, espoused that they were it, it was a non-aligned country, and we became more involved with ourselves. SARC was born, and there was a bit of an activity, a lot of activity, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, much noise, no action, perhaps, but but the sense of South Asianism grew. To a certain extent, I think we could be going back to the to the old classical uh, era now of, of linking ourselves to the rest of the world, the uh, uh, the outlook that you spoke of, etc., speaks to that, and we are becoming more also linked to global politics and seeking to make up for power balance, power imbalances with our neighbors by looking to friends in various camps in the in the world world uh, world beyond. Uh, and another small footnote on, on the idea that you see nuclear powers don't fight. Of course, you, you, you don't stick to that, but uh, it has always been a case. There's always a danger of nuclear powers fighting among themselves, even Russia, Soviet U uh, Union and China 
uh, both with nuclear powers when they had this Amudarya uh, incidents. Uh, India, China, of course, and then uh, then uh, India, Pakistan, and so this is uh, there is no theoretical reason uh, to give strength to that idea actually. Uh, so there is a danger that nuclear country, our countries can fight and we can go into a uh, nuclear war. Okay, now we will now move to the uh, non-technological, uh, no, non, uh, uh, traditional aspects of security. Uh, yeah, you, and for that we will turn to Farzana Manna, who is an associate professor of international relations. Farzana. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good morning to you all. Uh, thank you for in inviting me and I truly ap appreciate your attendance. Uh, today I am going to discuss uh, non-traditional challenges to security, the, uh, the South Asian landscape and particularly my focus will be on climate change and its challenges to uh, human security of South Asia. Uh, before uh, discussing the meat and potatoes of my topic, uh, I will give a uh, a brief overview of non-traditional security challenges, uh, climate change scenario of South Asia, climate change and its challenges to uh, human security, and I will analyze from its uh, uh, South Asian perspective. Uh, the, uh, uh, the world is witnessing a number of security challenges which is non-military in, in nature. Uh, examples of some uh, non-traditional security challenges are climate changes, pandemics, food and water scarcity, transnational crimes uh, such as uh, cyber security. They have some common characteristics. Uh, apart from non-military in nature, these threats do not stem from competition between states or shifts in balance of power. Threats are often caused by uh, human dis uh, induced disturbance. Uh, consequences of these threats are often difficult to reverse or repair. Uh, uh, national solutions are often inadequate and thus require regional and multilateral cooperation. The object of security is no longer just the state or state sovereignty or territorial integrity, but also people, their survival, well-being, dignity, both at individual and communal levels. However, though these threats or challenges may be non-military in nature, they can nonetheless lead to conflict or even war. For example, a war over crucial but scarce resources like uh, oil or water. Uh, <coughs> climate change uh, scenario of South Asia. The global climate risk index uh, ranks Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, and India second, fourth, ninth, and 14th respectively in the list of nations most affected by the extreme weather events. The sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change underlined the impact on South Asia series. Air pollution has reduced the intensity as well as frequency of monsoon rains in India and the rest of South Asia. This report also identifies large scale displacement, a um, 11 to 20 percent increase in the number of people at risk of hunger and infrastructural and other losses as some consequences. It also states that the impact of climate change could result in a loss of 2% of GDP in South Asian countries by 2050. Uh, the relationship between climate change and its impact on uh, human security. The effects of climate change uh, to human security varies across the world. This is because climate change uh, related vulnerabilities depend on certain factors. For example, the more people are dependent on climate sensitive forms of natural capitals, the more at risk they are from climate change and it adverse effects. Yet, uh, climate change does not undermine uh, human security in isolation. A range of social factors like poverty, state policy, people's access to economic opportunities, the extent of social cohesion, etc., influence various aspects of uh, human security. Uh, analyzing this uh, uh, from South Asian from, uh, uh, perspective, South Asia is a densely populated region. It, it is the home of 1.5 billion people, one quarter of the world's population. Most of the people depend on agriculture for their livelihood. 
Uh, South Asia has the highest concentration of poor people in the world with more than 500 million people living in extreme poverty. Most of the land is uh, used for agricultural purposes. Therefore, loss of agricultural land or loss of land fertility due to climate change has increased the vulnerabilities of this region affecting different aspects of human security. I'm going to discuss the existing and potential threats of climate change to the human security of uh, South Asia, particularly in the context of three components of uh, human security perspective, namely freedom from war, freedom from fear, freedom to live with dignity. Uh, free, uh, in case of freedom from war, for example, food security, uh, threats to food security. Food production and food security are clearly dependent on climate change, particularly uh, at a time of increasing population in the developing world. Climate change can affect each aspect of food security, including access to food, stability of food price. Largely, it can impact food production in four ways. First, rising temperature may cross the tolerance level of some crops. Changing rainfall pattern may make the arable land infertile. Sea level rise can make the coastal fertile land unusable by possible inundation and increased extreme weather events like cyclones, flooding, droughts will affect agriculture adversely and put pressure on prices. For example, in 2017, Bangladesh has experienced three episodes of flash floods. These floods affected larger areas of the countries, particularly northern parts, and the livelihoods of about 8 million people. Agricultural sector was affected by the losses of main staple food rice, livestock, and fish stocks. Due to the effects of these floods, the price of coarse rice rose by 20% across the country. The price rise of main staple food raised concern for the poorer people to have access to food. Analyzing from the point of uh, food security, climate change has the potential to pose a threat, a threat to food security to South Asia. This is because it can put challenges to the people to have both physical and economic access to basic food by eradication to uh, of their uh, capacities to grow food for themselves due to agricultural land irrigation and land loss and by lowering their purchasing power. People in developing regions spend more money on food. If food prices increase, people will not have enough money to spend on education, health, housing. So climate change may indirectly affect food security and other securities in this way in future. Uh, Move on to the threats to economic security. As discussed earlier, the negative effects of climate change have reduced the amount of agricultural land. So it would affect the employment status of many people who are dependent on the agricultural sector in South Asia. For example, uh, in Bangladesh, approximately 70% of the employment in the coastal Bangladesh is dependent on agriculture. But the regular cyclones, storms destroy uh, arable lands and fishing equipments and thus making them vulnerable to uh, unemployed. So uh, analyzing from economic uh, security, uh, sorry, uh, some field studies um, uh, found a trend of people uh, being forced to move to new areas. Consequently, many people lost their jobs in the agriculture and fishing sectors. It increased their economic insecurity and thus forced to seek other jobs. Climate change induced displaced people's average income goes down because of the shortage of work and increased competition to get work. Those who moved to a city for work, work face difficulties of finding jobs with their unskilled status. Those who move to urban areas usually earn more from their area of origin. But these earning un earnings are not enough to recover due to the high cost of living in urban areas. Some migrants often have to pay the uh, cost of migration by losing their livestock, jewelry and savings. Hence, this economic insecurity may be difficult for them to re uh, recover from their losses. 
in terms of health security we all know that one of the severe effects of climate change is the shortage of safe drinking water in this region about 20 million people in coastal districts of bangladesh are already affected by salinization in their drinking water this can also affect the health security of them by causing increased number of causes of diarrhea cholera and other waterborne diseases now i will highlight some points uh, in terms of freedom from fear for example social conflicts over resources the climate change uh, related internal displacement of population may create intense competition and conflict over key resources like land housing food water and employment land is critically scarce resources in a densely populated and agrarian uh, region like south asia internal population displacement in south asia created tension and conflict over land in several ways first complete uh, uh, competition over free land uh, led to tension conflict and insecurity between the displaced population uh, as well as as well as between the displaced and local people in the destination area second in some instances dispute uh, arose whose uh, when private uh, land owners evicted this displaced population from their lands causing further violence by the displaced poor people's migration from rural areas to urban slum area has created some tensions and insecurity for uh, slum dwellers too <coughs> uh analyzing from this point of view uh, uh, by creating so uh, social conflicts over resources climate change indirectly has posed threat to the personal security of the individuals in south asia it increases the risk of physical violence between the climate change induced displaced persons and the local people over resources then i move to uh, threats to freedom uh, to live in dignity as i said earlier the most likely effect of climate change in south asia is likely to experience is population displacement it can take place in two levels domestic and international levels these two trends of migration have already taken place in this region uh, effects of climate change are likely to worsen the situation it has become clear that the climate hazards induce population displacement in south asia however uh, environmental drivers play indirect role to influence migration decision the effects of climate change will influence other related uh, catalyst of migration like economic political etc people migrate for better life in many receiving areas migrants tend to do quote unquote 3d jobs dirty difficult and dangerous seasonal works and working in the informal sector in some cases the socio economic condition of displaced population deteriorated after the displacement so uh, people generally move for a better life and survival but the contemporary evidence suggests that in most cases socio economic condition and living standards of this climate change induced displaced population deteriorate during and after the displacement analyzing from this view the effects of climate change has posed threats to the individuals freedom to live with dignity as as it led them to the critical situation and put them in widespread threats so uh, overall effects of climate change have already posed threats to some aspects of uh, human security of south asia this climate change induced uh, human insecurities may induce conventional security concerns by inducing cross border population displacement although the state of current research over the matter in the south asia context is currently limited i postulate that climate change will exacerbate the existing tension in the region uh, thank you for listening thank you ana uh, i like your methodology you took wilsonian aspirations and broke down your analysis of yes. climate change yes. fit those those aspirations for from this that and the other uh, just to sort of uh, uh, complement uh, yes. what you said uh, there was a, i mean everything you have said uh, points to the fact that collaboration has remained in the region hostage to hostilities mm -hmm. but at this expert level there was a glimmer of hope 
in the conference of parties at uh, 27, mm -hmm. where you know we collaborated, experts did it, on, on this idea of separate financial facility for loss and damage, LND. Now, uh, uh, what's going to happen uh, is that if LND uh, is to be uh, a, a, a robust operation and financial mechanism, we will probably need more collaboration mm -hmm. in COP28 uh, uh, COP among, among these countries. Now, of course, the similarity in our social practices and cultural norms uh, sort of uh, render uh, knowledge sharing easier among experts, experts. And which sort of, you know, it's interesting because they're sometimes dealing themselves from the political uh, milieu. Now, for example, Bangladesh's risk reduction program, India's renewable mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. investments, Pakistan's living Indus uh, initiative, Nepal's contribution to mountain science are all examples of best practices that can uh, can be used for cross-border collaboration. In fact, you know, I mean, uh, uh, even in COVID-19, I think COVID-19, where uh, uh, Nilay made a ref reference to that, there was some initiative uh, taken on, on mask wearing, etc., which uh, which I thought uh, is uh, is a potential for uh, for creating a lasting legacy of collaboration across South Asia. I just wanted to throw one uh, uh, idea uh, uh, here uh, uh, for you to consider. That is a, a possibility of Bangladesh's unique positioning. Uh, in uh, in being able to uh, convene, for example, a regional regional COP uh, to develop a regional agenda um, uh, solu uh, solution with the objective of promoting uh, climate cooperation, coordinated action for what some of our experts have called one South Asia in climate change. J just just a point. Now it it will give me great pleasure, of course, to give the floor and the microphone turn the floor and microphone over to uh, Brigadier. Uh, 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 Shahid al uh, to talk to uh, the hard security issues. <coughs> thank you, uh, Thank you, Sifai. Uh, alaikum and good morning. I have been asked to uh, delve on the hard security issues. <clears throat> Being a military man, perhaps it is only appropriate that I do. But hard securities do not deal only with military issues. There are other aspects of hard security. But I'll uh, start by flagging two points that the that the chairman had uh, uh, articulated in his preferred remarks. First is what is uh, what is security, and he gave a very scholarly. Uh, explanation of what is security. I'll give a very down-to-earth uh, common man's uh, uh, explanation of security, whatever, what I understand by security, is, 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 is uh, uh, to have a situation, have an environment as would allow one individual, nation, group of people to live, exist, operate, work without any external or internal coercive influences affecting its, theirs operation, either it is diplomatic, economic, or political. If these aspects can be ensured, I think we can be relatively uh, secure and safe and perhaps move towards development. At the same time, we should be prepared enough to be able to fend off the negative influences that might impinge on your freedom of action as individuals, as a nation, as a group of people. <clears throat> the second point he flagged, and I think it's very important, this is where perhaps our entire discussion perhaps uh, should, should, should revolve on, is we are, a, we, are a, we, are a, we are a very important region, yet our regionalism lacks the vibe, the verb, the, 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 the strength that it should. It is not as what it might be, it could be, it should be. I'll try to answer some of the some of the questions, perhaps offer some of the reasons why it is not so. And I start by suggesting that when you talk of South Asia, we cannot forget the history of South Asia. When you talk about South Asia, we should remember that it is not a singular security construct. I 
every single country has its own security compulsions, its own security perception. And that has to do with, uh, with, 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 with the development, political development of the region. Post-1947, post-Cold War, and all the three or four major uh, points of change that occurred in world politics, in world geopolitics, in world history, following the Second World War up to the present time. And these countries did not have a, 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 a similar uh, perception of threat. That is why they veered towards different directions and sought comfort in alignment with countries they felt would provide them the security that they needed. The problematic was of, 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 the, of South Asia is that most of the problems, uh, although they are sui generic, but many of the major issues that impact on the policies and that force formulation of policies are externally generated. Many of the problems that we have faced, terrorism for example, or, or ideological terrorism to be exact, this, the, the, the reasons did not stem from within the region. But these, 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 uh, if this, this phenomena was driven by, by, by happenings outside the region. Uh, you may disagree, but that is, that is, that is, that is my problem. So baggage of history, our, 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 our dif different alliances, different, different dynamics, and therefore the different perceptions of threats. Finally, the two major countries, in fact, uh, the, 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 I say it is the unipolar, unipolar region because of dominance. Uh, Barry Buzan has said it's unipolar region using his sort of regional security, security complex argument that it is a unipolar country with one country domin uh, dominating uh, the rest of the region. But in spite of that, uh, the two major countries, they think, they all they consider each other to be the main source of threat. Although India has stated very clearly that its defense orientations are not focused towards Pakistan, more focused towards China than Pakistan in all its in all in all its uh, military military preparations. <clears throat> the next point is the fact that. We are a strong, we are an important region which you have not internalized and therefore we are weak. Remember, some of these, the strength that accrues from our geopolitical location can be, can be, can, can sort of accentuate our vulnerabilities or attenuate our vulnerabilities depending on how we play it. Uh, our location. Uh, it straddles uh, uh, two important regions. It overlooks the next important area of big power contention, the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. And this, will, this area is going to be the next sort of bone of contention. Unfortunately, we also host two pathologically sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, personal adversaries in India and Pakistan. The unique feature that Nila, you mentioned, that there are two nuclear armed countries. They are not a nuclear armed countries. There is no other region in the world where two nuclear countries antagonistic to each other share common borders. You will not be able to cite any other example where two Nuclear countries share borders, yet there has not been a nuclear war. But that will take another separate seminar to, to, to discuss why there has not been. Close proximity not only to the Indo-Pacific, but this region borders 
the next great power that is china and the second great next great power that is india and i think it is important for us to understand uh, the 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 comparison between the two countries of course <laughs> they are unbeatable in so far as the, the 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 population is concerned but militarily china is the uh, um, uh, you know the 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 single largest it is it is the largest army and the third largest army second largest army china and india 2 2 million 2.2 million 1.5 million india is the is the and i'll come to and why i'm saying this because i'll come to the nuclear fallacy and uh, 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 disarmament fallacy india is the largest importer of arms china's uh, uh, military expenditure is second in the world about 300 billion india's 80 billion one fourth but <clears throat> don't forget the history of clashes between china and india i'm talking about the recipes i'm talking about the possibilities that will impact or what might impact on the on this on 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 this on this on the security environment so 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 this is perhaps one the, these are some one of the uh, of, of the few uh, sort of uh, reasons why we have not been able to uh, jockeying for space jockeying for importance now south asia as i'll discuss eventually is going to be a hotbed and i repeat it without apologizing because of the importance of indo pacific and the focus of indo pacific bangladesh articulator is is in the it's not a policy but it is it is just is the outlook is an uh, is an outlook we can discuss that uh, that let, later on but the big power rivalry is something that will demand uh, demand these countries of the region particularly bangladesh to 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 modulate its policies in a manner that would allow it to utilize the benefit of 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 an of an of an, of an arrangement without being a part of any military mili military military uh, military block what are the potential areas of 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 conflict uh that apart from apart from indo pacific as i said uh many of these are sui generis many of the asian countries and i think one of the most important uh things that we face is the privation of common common resources water is one thing that i have in mind common resources form of water is something that and the next conflict that might take place in part of the world will be will be caused by 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 the deprivation of 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 water uh the possibility of a in the pak conflict uh the 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 possibility of china india conflict uh, the proliferation proliferation of small arms licit weapons this is where the 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 security fallacy the nuclear fallacy or 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 the non proliferation fallacy comes in nuclear uh, countries do not fight it's i think it's a wrong it's, it's a wrong premise india and pakistan have fought uh classical wars L short lived uh there has not been a wider conflagration perhaps because uh the two countries had nuclear weapons but we do not know what is the threshold uh state of either of these two countries at what point in time would they resort to the use of nuclear weapons these threshold policies have not been as 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 nato had done in its Uh, in his in his uh, policy papers they had a threshold threshold a limit we don't know what is threshold of india or pakistan or pakistan but the fact is that there has not been a wider conflagration but that does not mean that there has not been proliferation of weapons as statistics so because this is the fallacy when countries think that we have nuclear weapons so there will be no war yet they want to uh, also avoid not only avoid but to be prepared for a conventional war mm. so while nuclear weapons prevents nuclear war proliferation of 
licit traditional weapons continues. So I think this proliferation, uh, the likely tension between uh, the two countries may, may flare up in, an, an, in a manner. The, the, the fact that uh, uh, global warming, something that she had said, and I want to impress on it, is uh, and that 25 percent of, of our land will go underwater. Uh, the demographic shift, the, the, the force, you know, the demography, population pressure is like water pressure. It sets its own level. So this, what will this, these people of this 25 percent uh, land of Bangladesh will go? They will seek what is known as Lebanon, not in that, not in that traditional sense, but new areas will have to be, will have to be, will have to be sought, will have to be sought in higher areas and higher grounds. And this is not one way. We have seen when people in northern, <coughs> uh, northeastern part of India, people came over in the Silet region inside Bangladesh and South Central. So these are natural phenomena. But when it will happen large scale, the, the prospect of conflict, the prospect of conflict will, 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 will occur. So gentlemen, I think uh, although we have uh, uh, areas to cooperate, our mindset, our, 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 our historical, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, yes. So the trigger areas, the, 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 the potential uh, areas of conflict, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Myanmar situation, I'm not delving on it uh, in the end of time. Extremism and political, uh, political extremism. The good thing to note is that although from the point of view of global peace index, uh, South Asia has sort of, uh, it's a deteriorated, we have retarded. In so far as the uh, global trade index is concerned, uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, features 43. We have improved. But South Asia happens to be the second largest area affected by terrorism. But these terrorism are not always uh, generated uh, by religious extremism or, 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 or religion, but the other factors are the forms of, of terrorism that are driven, driven by it. So this is something that we have to, we have to, be, we have to be careful about. As I said, we have, there was a drop of, of, of number of deaths from terrorism. Although Afghanistan uh, remains number one, Pakistan second, sixth, India 13th. The Indo-Pacific big part of it. And the cli climate-induced uh, tension that uh, are likely to impact our security environment. With this very brief and, and as you know, I said, two pence worth of remarks, I say thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Shaheed. Uh, Brigadier has, uh, I've known him since, uh, since he joined the, as a, 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 the armed forces as an officer and gentleman years and years ago. And ever I since, I can talk about the officer, but not the gentleman. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, he's been an asset to the to the armed forces, of course, and excellent, and nothing less was expected of you. But uh, your subject was so tempting. I mean, for someone who has been in this area for at least area of international relations to to join the debate, as if it were. Yeah, uh, I would like to sort of bring uh, in my a few remarks to the, to, to, the, to the region itself, the dangers, uh, uh, notwithstanding that its uh, linkage with the rest of the global uh, system it enhances the risks. So in, in terms of sheer uh, firepower, I think, I mean, last year, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan and India were rated as, okay, India and Pakistan were rated as fourth and ninth in terms of firepower among uh, 142 countries. And you talked proliferation, okay, there Nuclear warheads is 130 to 160 apiece. Uh, Pakistan has a fissile material advantage, therefore more rapidly able to produce short-range uh, nuclear weapons, which is what, what they need, because tactical at theater, because they don't need anything more than 3,000 uh, kilometers anyway. But doctrinally, on the nuclear side, India maintains a no-first-use policy and has developed a triad capability, land, air, and sea. And now, uh, Pakistan shifted, I mean, so India has this conventional advantage, but Pakistan shifted its nuclear doctrine from credible uh, minimum deterrence to full spectrum deterrence in 2015. But mind you, this has a tremendous uh, theoretical implication. It means that the idea of deterrence 
uh, is lowered the threshold. So it, it's a one-dimensional policy that uh, uh, deter uh, tactical weapons could be used to stop a conventional advance. Uh, a bit like what uh, what the NATO uh, position was during uh, uh, the Cold War, that if sort of Soviet tanks came into Germany, I mean, it would uh, create a tripwire effect, and and NATO would react react with uh, with nuclear when weapons. The IG, I, when the IGB was breached. Yeah, that's right. The bridge of the IGB. Yeah, but, border. yeah but, but the danger is that sort of the doctrinal uh, advocacy of nuclear war fighting capability. Now, that can result in horrendous consequences. Uh, also, public, public pronouncements to that effect. Now, incautious remarks could result in laying what is what we all know as the Thucydides trap, which is uh, uh, miscalculations can read, lead to calamitous war, as we all know. Uh, the Greek historian Thucydides, while explaining the causes of the Pel Peloponnesian War, had famously said that when Athens grew strong, there was great fear in Sparta and war was uh, ine inevitable. So, okay, so we have finished the uh, panelists now. I will uh, open the floor to discussions, questions and answers and begin by General, uh, General and Ambassador Shahid al-Haq. Uh, after that, we will uh, l allow the... Uh, Okay, Ambassador. Uh, the uh, panelists, okay, after Ambassador, then uh, to react for the uh, after the first round, and then we'll open it again for the second round. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Admiral. Sorry, I'm Admiral. Admiral. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for yeah. making me General. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, Admiral is the senior service. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 Admirals identify uh, distinctly differently. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, uh, sir, you have also mentioned, Brigadier Shahid, have also mentioned uh, comfortably that uh, you know the South Asia is becoming very important, and regionalism is weak. That's uh, solid. Uh, not only weak, I think regionalism. We are anti-regional. Nothing works here. Sark has gone to the slumber, and BCIM has been taken out of the BRI. Still, uh, no, no headway. BIMSTEC, uh, somehow it has been chartered. Uh, we do not know how far it will go. So uh, it doesn't give a, a good picture at all. And the consequence uh, that I would like to contest your assertion that South Asia is becoming important. Uh, look at the uh, US uh, national security strategy and uh, national defense strategy of 2022. I mean, that matters about the Indo-Pacific. No mention about South Asia as an entity. Southeast Asia is the central piece of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Only mention has been made as a contingency that when you, uh, US wants to uh, become a, a build a uh, integrated uh, deterrence, there uh, the South Asian partners comes into play to bring India into the picture. Otherwise no mention of South Asia. So I'd like to hear about you that how do you consider that South Asia is become important? Rather, we should be critical of ourselves that how we are losing everything in that thing. Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, uh, this doesn't belong to, uh, you know, South Asia. It belongs to the Southeast Asia more because it is centered on uh, 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 the Malacca Strait, uh, the Malacca Dilemma, uh, there is the epicenter of the uh, Southeast Asia, not South Asia. And the second uh, question would be Dr. Niloy. You have mentioned about the strategic balancing by India. Yes, India can afford it, uh, you know, whenever it comes to its interest, it will go towards the American uh, tilt for the nuclear technology, capital and all. But whenever it comes to, you know, cheap oil uh, from Russia and other things, I am strategically, you know, uh, uh, neutral or uh, autonomy, st strategic autonomy. So this is the thing only the India can play here. But given the Bangladesh scenario, uh, we have uh, discussed about the Matarbari seaport. I think it is an epoch-making initiative on part of us. Connectivity is not the end. It is the means. If you think about the connectivity, the thing uh, that we have opened formally uh, through the NBR notification, 14 point uh, routes have been identified. 
or advantage will definitely go to India. But what we are looking for is the connectivity the means to the trade and investment in the area, linchpin being the mother body, uh, they are the economic benefit that we are going to accrue of this entire belt of uh, uh, you know landlocked uh, region of northeast asia uh, uh, india and then uh, you know nepal bhutan if it is uh, bro brought to now in this case for bangladesh you said that you don't like the uh, uh, cold war terminologies what option is left for bangladesh except for hedging because we can't balance we can't bend wagon is only the you know maybe the uh, very tricky hazing uh, that uh, uh, thing that uh, I would like to know uh, how how do you see the Bangladesh's role here? Our uh, you know on the face it is fine. We want the economic benefit trade and here, but geopolitics is there embedded, uh, and it will attract more and more uh, competition. Uh, how do you uh, uh, do there? And if it is a question of hazing. What sort of innovation should we bring? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions and what I thought was very profound observations, actually. That was more, more important. Yes, sir. You, you, you. Thank you. It's always an education to follow these seminars. Uh, I just have questions rather than uh, some observations. Um, one thing is about scales of power we have scales of power uh, because there is some level of quantification we need to have because uh, there are powerful nations and we have the small nation power. How are we going to balance these two because there sorry, are come again, scales of power, yes. I'm sorry. come again, uh, start again from the question. I no, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just noting some things which mm, okay. I hope I get a response for this. Um, we need to have an understanding about the scales of power. Mm in the region. Uh, then what region are we speaking about? Um, then we have powerful nations. Now, does this equate to hegemonic power? Well, we are always missing out the hegemony you know, because uh, we, we think of our operational scales in this whole region. Um, we, have, we, have, we have forgotten the hegemony exercised by particular powers. You need not be a militarily powerful nation, but you can have a hegemony in another area. Have the small nation power. As against this, what are the small nations doing? For instance, my own country, Sri Lanka. How do we save this, save this situation? Because Sri Lanka is in a such a strategically location place. It's all mean, almost been balkanized uh, with the kind of power play around the island. Um, then also, given the power rivalry, how much can we understand the security reasons? Are we having a tunnel view about these things or taking sides on this whole thing uh, or being partial about it uh, in this whole scenario? Then also, about the issue on the Asia-Pacific region, is that diluting the central location of the Indian Ocean. How much this whole thing is coming as a debate, the Asia-Pacific importance because of the BNR, then also the other countries coming into play, United States coming into this region. Now, now what, what, is, what is the status? Or are we being drawn into a new vortex beyond that? And also, is the Iora a myth? Now, we know the intra tension amongst the IRA countries. This also must be taken into consideration when we are looking at the, um, the, the, the what you call the regional areas. And of course, someone mentioned that Bay of Bengal is turning out to be the new focal point of tension in the next two to three years. Yes. Thank, you. Uh, th thank you, Ambassador. Uh, these were in many ways precursor or you're prepping for your next role, upcoming role in Sri Lanka, when you yourself will need to answer some of the questions that you have posed to yourself. Yeah. Okay. I will now uh, uh, let the panel. Uh, Rush, do you want to say before the panel? No. Panelists will respond. Actually, you want to ask Rush. 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 Rush
Okay, short question. I mean, short question may have a long answer, but. Uh, <laughs> My question is to Brigadier Shahidul Anam Khan. I'm uh, Abu Rush, the editor of Bangladesh Defense Channel. Sir, uh, uh, have you forgotten the uh, Burma Act? This is going to uh, have the maximum implications for us, for the region, because we are just beside Myanmar. And the second thing is that for you that do you think that absence of democracy, the democratic values, the social and political instabilities, these are creating security problem and we Bangladeshis are also in it, isn't it? You look at Pakistan, look at Sri Lanka, look at Afghanistan or look at just Myanmar, what happened there? So these are also bringing or inviting security problems. And please remember that Burma Act, there are two words, rigorous military, through rigorous military. These true two words, and Myanmar is just beside us. So, sir, what do you think? Okay, reverse order. Shall we go in reverse order? Starting okay. with Brigadier Anand. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's start with uh, Ambassador Sarah. Yes, uh, Ambassador, we are carrying the baggage of uh, history, as I said in my opening uh, sentences, uh, that uh, the, 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 the security scenario as it is today, some of it has been inherited, inherited from the past. Or they appear perhaps in a different uh, tone, and, tone and character, perhaps in some, in some, some specs. But they are, they are the, 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 the remnants, remnants of the past and we are, we are, we are living with it. Uh, new dimensions have been added because of the new geopolitical developments, uh, uh, because, because, because of uh, various developments post Cold War and the other phases uh, uh, in between the Cold War or and, 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 and the um, breakup of the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Yes. Uh, so, so, so therefore, uh, yes, we are, and this is the, the remnants of the year. Uh, why Sark has failed? Uh, as I said, it will take. Uh, sh there should be separate. Why Sark has failed? And I think Sark has failed because of the of the, the, the inherently uh, abrasive uh, uh, positions uh, or, or, or relationship between 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 uh, India, India and uh, India and uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, it is it is it is clearly mentioned in the Sark Charter that uh, that that, that uh, bilateral issues. Uh, Will not be considered when it comes to SARC and SARC meetings. Yet bilateralism has prevailed uh, over multilateralism, and is entirely uh, the, the, the predominant uh, the, the power in this, in this region, who has always insisted on bilateral um, on bilateral rather than uh, multilateralism, and that is why SARC has suffered so, so badly. We have all the instruments they are talking about. To tackle, to tackle poverty, to tackle uh, narcotics and drugs, to tackle extremism, to tackle terrorism. I think, I think these instruments perhaps uh, uh, we don't find in any other regions uh, or any other uh, multilateral uh, uh, setup. Yet we have not been able to establish one of the finest. If you read, if you, if you read the, the text of these of these of the instruments, one of the finest. Yet we have not been able to. It is, it, is, it is because of the implacable, implacable positions that the, these two countries have taken vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis each other. Um, I hope uh, it partly answers Siraj, yes, yes, to some extent. The role okay, of wait, the NSA uh, is an important aspect, I think, it was, but it was ad adequately covered. But it is, it, is, it is a matter of concern. In fact, in certain countries, uh, at one point in time, um, many non-state actors were actually stronger in terms of their ability to command weapon and command the situation stronger than the than the uh, state actors uh, in many countries sri lanka for example and the ambassador very out. but this is another perhaps uh, issue that we should, should cover but the, the, the possibility of uh, nuclear weapons uh, falling in the hand of non state actors uh, it has it has it has it has uh, become more relevant because of the fact that uh, Pakistan is going for tactical weapons. 
And when you make tactical weapons, they have to be distributed that tactical way. So that 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 the possibility of disintegration means that. Uh, the centralized command will not be there, or command may be there, but oversight may not be possible. It will be at the end of the state. But Pakistan has uh, something known as SAC, Special Arms Division, specially organized to look after uh, the nuclear installations and nuclear weapons. It is the fifth largest, yeah. uh, contains the fifth largest nuclear warriors in the world. So that is especially, and, 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 and I think uh, uh, this is one of the uh, positive signs that Pakistan will not allow for its own uh, uh, survival to fall into the hands of the non-state actors. But I am talking about possibilities. Uh, you cannot say for sure that might not happen. In the realm of uh, possibilities, anything can happen. And to say that this will not happen for us is, 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 is. This, 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 uh, the hegemonic powers are yes, there are hegemonic partners and hegemonic, because of the hegemonic uh, attitude, uh, the other countries were forced to look outside the region, to look at the balancing uh, power, to look at, at, at powers that will be able to uh, sort of uh, bring an equity uh, and, and bolster their own ability to to, 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 to stand up to its hegemonic proclivities. Uh, unfortunately, not, unfortunately, Indian oceans may not be relegated to the, to, the, to the background, but Asia Pacific has come to the fore. And much, as much as what the, uh, the, the, the Americans say, that is not to counter China, I think uh, if we read between the lines, uh, the motivating factor is to see that uh, China's progress uh, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its aspiration to dominate the world. Right. Is this, is no let me, let me uh, finish. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. That is true, and it is, it is, it is, it is. China is the number one uh, adversary. Uh, America has done that. India has also done that. Another adversary, Indian adversary, is, is China. So there, in some respects, there. Uh, strategic security interests converge, and that is why this consonance of thought, views, and action, and quad, and the other things. So um, uh, this 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 vortex, inevitably, we are a part of it. I don't think we, uh, um, uh, Indian Ocean or the or the or, or South Asia is 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 uh, will be in the backwaters. It is it it will be not. If, if if by default, and I use the word by default for want of a better term. By default, South Asia will uh, will 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 will, will uh, assume importance. In fact, that our close proximity with China, who is going to be the next leading power, and of the, of on of of India being an integral part of South Asia, we are going to be uh, in, in the limelight in the importance, and people will come running to us because South Asia. Is an, as they say, the new boy on the block. Right. But all the pretty girls will come. Okay, thank uh, you. Thanks. Sorry, Bar the Barma. Barma is Barma. And I think it's very important, Ojakata, where the physical intervention to to, to counter this uh, physical <coughs> forces is, is very important. But you can borrow the. Yeah, okay. 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 <laughs> Okay. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, you are true. Uh, Bangladesh is hosting uh, uh, Rohingya refugees. Uh, any kind of migration, inc including climate change related migration, can intensify political and geopolitical uh, problems, particularly can raise tensions and conflicts in destination areas. This can happen if the migration crosses international borders or it is illegal uh, and concentrated in particular sources of destination. Climate change induced um, uh, migration may create geopolitical tensions if large numbers of people uh, migrate to a specific location over a short period of time. This situation may worsen in the absence of political leadership. According to the World Bank, the impact, uh, due to the impact of climate change, uh, about 30.3 million people in Bangladesh can be displaced by 2050. But I must say that we are not in a situation uh, 
uh, in the absence of uh, political le leadership. Our political leadership is, is, is strong. That's why uh, our, our government is balancing uh, between uh, Rohingya refugees and climate change induced uh, di displaced populations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sir, may uh, I Dr. Just, in, in Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll take really like one minute because I know that more questions and opinion are precious than, than I try to answer all the questions, which is not definitely possible. It's not the answer, just the perspectives. I think um, Ambassador Shira sir and also has uh, some communities uh, and I, I mean, to my opinion, it's just a perspective. I have moved myself from the Morganta or Mayor Shimer understanding of the uh, world structure, which is, I mean, mostly anarchy. And I think it's not about only anarchy, which I have made myself clear. Mm -hmm. It's more about uh, competition. Uh, so is Matarbari a strategic disaster? Or will it be a disaster? I think I'm not a fortune teller, but I can say and no, I mean, I'm not an economist as well, but I have never seen any economist's explanation that this will not be a trade hub. And not, not I have not, not be a trade hub or not trade, be a beneficiary. Hub. I have never seen any defense strategist speaking that this will be a backyard of the great power. Because great power definition has changed. I've mentioned it is the multipolar world. So yeah, there might be a disaster in the future. We, we cannot you know tell it now at this moment. But I have I really not seen okay. that. Excuse me, if I can interject this question. What you forget is you're connecting this to the historical perspective. You know? Historical perspective is, is I've been ambassador to Japan. Of course. So I know Japan, you know, China, you know, perspective sure. very, very well. Unfortunately, in discussions in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. from the academics as well from those who practice, right. they are totally, totally, okay. which is my perspective, they are totally bliss blissfully ignorant about, you know, the China-Japanese conflict yeah. that is sure. there. They don't know at all. No, I, the, the, I, I definitely would like love to read an academic piece on that, no, no, which have the, more evidence that this will be a standard. The, but no. uh, or maybe a policy perspective as well. But I, I, I mean, I have I've never seen anything like that which has evidence that this will be a difficult and strategic difficulties. And because I mean, you know, this deep support doesn't say that it will be selective to particular countries and not self, not not accept others. Like you know. Uh, and you know, of course, the uh, the the visit of Japanese Prime Minister to North East in India last year, anymore, also. So you know, the, the, I mean, that also says that how uh, this will be um, an interesting regional hub hub of trade. So you know, of course, one can be pessimistic, one can be optimistic. There are two versions of the world order explaining world order, but as of now, I I have not. You know enough support to be pessimistic at this moment. So yes, emerging tech. We have discussed about emerging, you know, a security threats. I, I guess like it's more about like how you interpret it. We discussed about the role of Afghanistan, the position of Afghanistan, and the role of uh, extra regional and internal countries, regional countries over there, because this is a very important hub. There are problems. We also discussed about Myanmar, which is not technically a part of South Asia, but it is an important connecting point. I think. What Awasar has said that, you know, you know, South Asia, because, you know, the South, understanding of South Asia has changed. Of course, understanding of South Asia has changed. It's not a South Asia which has been developed in mid-90s and late 90s. Uh, sorry, mid-1980s and late 1980s. It's a different South Asia and it has different, you know, whether you consider from the, uh, you know, land perspective or from the uh, maritime perspective. It's, of course, a different South Asia. So we cannot just, uh, you know, say that South Asia is... A, uh, is not resolving its old crisis. Yes, we are struggling with our old crisis. You know, there are scholarships which I say that there are mostly post-colonial countries. We are, but I think it's also an excuse to avoid kind of like you know why whether we cannot move forward. Uh, you know, regardless of our colonial past or not, there are problems. But we have also learned how to move forward with the existing problems. My last point sir, is that um, you know. Um, Strategic, we are not hedging because the basic difference between hedging and strategic competition is that hedging is directed by the quote unquote great powers in the Cold War government. How they want, we religiously follow that. Yes, there might be some elements to that, but I think in the last couple of years, two cases in India and Bangladesh, we have done strategic comp you know, balancing, not always followed by what has been asked by others, quote unquote, in an imaginary point of view. Sir. So that is my two cents again in understanding between the strategic competitions or <laughs> balancing versus hedging as a whole world concept. But does, does the balancing need more, uh, you know, more power? No, oh. no, it okay, we, on, it is, we, the power is always relative. All right, uh, these are points of view anyway. I mean, yes. we have uh, we are running out of time. We have two more uh, 
uh, questions on uh, uh, yes two more uh, questions i think atm zahir and tanvir habib i'm afraid i'll have to okay uh, all right we will of course uh, yeah thank you ambassador thank you thank you for your part of, uh, participation yes yeah. uh, good morning yeah and assalamu alaikum okay uh, i have uh, one uh, the comment about the global um, security scenario uh, which is very relevant now uh, if you have observed that uh, both germany and japan has been militarized now they had a pacifist constitution now the powers which once made them pacifists now have encouraged them to become uh, militarized and their focus being more on geopolitics and uh, geosecurity now and this affects us also so we should not forget this and this is a new phenomenon it has been taking place when it has been exposed now now coming back to south asia now south asia and south asian countries as um, the chairman has been telling uh, is is now uh, it is externalized to a great extent uh, there are push and pull from both within and outside and it is this is uh, dangerous for us because it is intruding into our domestic politics it is intruding into who we can choose as friends it is intruding into who we can even select as our development partners and we see a new rivalry being created especially in our case where who should be our number one development partner now there is an act of elbowing out uh, and and this is dangerous for bangladesh and i want uh, this development have we had enough research on it and how, where we are heading to real thank you very much thank you thank you so much general uh, yes very very quickly and then we'll finish up with uh, right. i'll just uh, be asking two questions Roman. so firstly on behalf of the back benches yeah. in this forum in a geopolitical sense let me thank all the very contributors good. in this forum so i'm tanvir i'm a lecturer in the department of international relations at university of dhaka so my i'll be very brief and be very focused so first question is to professor niloy in terms of um using concepts from a securitization process or perhaps the broader contribution of the copenhagen school right could you kindly um let us know or probably discuss the implications of the emerging of very narrowing and rigid versions of nationalism across the region whether it's from india or pakistan or sri lanka or burma that, in that manner and how that might lead to a more uh, lack of con- uh, cooperation in terms of uh, climate induced migration so all the other aspects that were clearly in the fields that we could cooperate on secondly perhaps i'd like to focus on brigadier shahab um, in, in in terms of the fact that uh, during the phases where india was developing triad pakistan in support of its uh, credible and uh, minimum credible deterrence was focusing on permissive action links with american support to ensure that the nuclear weapons were properly handled was the, and uh, did not uh, pose it the risk of any uh, sudden escalations however with india's development of a triad and especially in terms of the developments that has happened in air camp, uh, in in aerospace especially the air launched brahmos missile which is capable of reaching up to mach 3 so India did have the capability to do counter forces strikes against Pakistan before and but what Brahmos has done is allowed India to go for decapitation strikes either against Pakistan nuclear installations or against Pakistan leadership and that perhaps has acted as a compelling factor why Pakistan has now shifted to a more triad based differences and a full spectrum deterrence right so perhaps you could discuss a bit more on some of the compelling factors and how that might impact the future of nuclear security in south asia thank you Thank you, thank you for those observations and questions, uh, Mr. Najib Rahman, the last but not the least, of course. I, 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 I'm uh, sorry, I'll have to close because there are only. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't have her. Okay, then you go first. Thank you. 
Um, mine is actually just a comment, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Thank you so much to all the panelists for presenting your ideas. Um, my comment was really about, we've talked a lot about emerging security challenges. I think something that we haven't really touched on was around cyber and cyber security as a future of technological challenges facing South Asia. So perhaps not for today, but just a suggestion for another um, session. Thank you very much. Good, good. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in the interest of time, I'll be very brief. Uh, the, the colleague has already touched upon the issue that I wanted to raise, that we wanted to hear more on the issue of cyber security. So thank you for raising this. Two, two other comments and then a simple question. Uh, number, number one comment would be uh, BIPS has already uh, established itself as a very good, beautiful platform to deal with security issues and also keep the people informed. I think uh, demystifying a lot of uh, unnecessary security concerns. I hope this will continue, number one. Secondly, at the end of each forum, there should be a very clear cut message uh, to, the, to the outside world. And uh, we should keep in mind that such forum uh, should not be uh, sort of misused by people to unnecessarily create controversies about some very, very benign um, development uh, projects. In my uh, in my capacity as the chairman of NVR, and in my capacity as the principal secretary to the prime minister, I have looked after Matabari. Uh, it, is, it is a great uh, development initiative. Uh, it is uh, full of uh, potentials not only for the country, but for the region, and also for the world. If you open an airport, any country can come. So we don't close an airport, or we don't stop building an airport that uh, enemy country B, C, and D will come, and they might jeopardize our our, our security. You, you take determined measures. You have your own internal security mechanism. On the Matabari, uh, my comment would be, the same. It is going to be a, definitely an economic hub. There, there will be a well-functioning port. Any country can take benefit. And I don't see, I, I fully rule out the possibility of, of any tension. It will rather uh, create a, a, an environment of peace and tranquility in the region. The question that I have uh, listening to uh, the panel, very enlightening panel, sir, and you are illuminating opening remarks. Uh, the panel has, uh, Dr. Mannan has rightly uh, identified the climate change issues and as the former DG environment and secretary climate change and uh, sort of environment forest. Uh, I appreciated that. There's a lot of learning. Uh, there, the developing countries like ours, when we attend all the COPs and other things, we also seek climate justice climate justice because of all the sufferings that we had to undergo. So how is the, now also question to Professor Niloy, how is the discipline of international relations is embracing the concept of climate justice in its discourse? Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, one minute each to the panelists to to respond. Do we have? Yeah. Okay. And not about the problems of water sharing. Okay. Water is a major threat. All right, good. If good. No water, right. our problems will again be much. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. good. Point taken. All right, we we'll start from Deloitte. Thank you, sir. Um, I think there was also you know, great questions in this term, but I'd like to just reiterate my point, particularly over here, when we talk about the perspectives of understanding. Uh, you know, the future of the region itself and again, you know, redefining the region quite significantly. Climate and climate-related cooperation will perhaps define the future quite significantly, not only positioning itself in the areas of quote-unquote non-traditional because there are, uh, you know, um, interdisciplinary into that. And as I've mentioned, like, you know, we have to, instead of just thinking that this is an anarchic world, 
uh, it's more important to think that how Anthropocene is the world structure is, where we need to consider you know, issues like climate justice, cooperations, and particularly there are few areas where we have more consonant, therefore, you know, explaining the cooperation, for example, when the issues of cybersecurity and other, uh, you know, similar kind of security issues have come forward. Now, importantly, and in the, the IR discipline is still very much Eurocentric, where we love to hear the words like hegemony, aging, and, you know, balance of power conventionally, and things like that. But again, the term hegemony itself, one of the big proponents is um, Antonio Gramsci, who says that hegemony doesn't always depend on, or does not at all depend on the military powers. It's more about the consensus. Now, in South Asia, have we ever come into a consensus to define someone as an engineer? So that question was raised and also kind of interesting, there is a comment uh, by, by uh, His Excellency Ambassador from Sri Lanka as well. So I, I just wanted to say like, you know, you know, we have been tracked into understanding and portraying and creating an imaginary meta region of quote unquote South Asia into a very conventional and linear defense centric sense which I believe is not the case and there are many areas where countries, not always all the countries, but countries have done tremendous cooperation and have, have really established examples of how to move forward climate is one of the areas and there are areas during the pandemic where we have worked together, we didn't work together, there were struggles that we, 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 uh, we have had. So I think it's very important to be optimistic, that's my last one. Very good. Okay. Do you have, do, all right. Sure. I just want to thank uh, Ms. Joanne for uh, bringing this out, uh, cyber security. It is indeed an issue that uh, must uh, occupy our thoughts, our minds, our, our discussions. In fact, uh, it's not that it didn't occur in my mind. Uh, it is not as if it didn't occur in our minds, uh, but uh, I was not sure whether it be in the classical sense a traditional security issue. Or a or a, or, or, or or an hard and fast culture or a non-traditional security. So I think perhaps we all three suffer from the same uh, problem. So uh, everybody's became became everybody's became baby became nobody's baby. But but I, I'm I'm told that the that the BIPSS will be uh, uh, organizing a separate. Uh, as in fact, the next war will be cyber war. In fact, the next will be cyber war. If we look at uh, the previous Russian uh, involvement in, 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 in um, not in Ukraine, but uh, it was it was all all cyber war, and cyber war will affect uh, our operations in the field as well. So, cyber security is something that that. May. In fact, we are we are suffering some, sometimes uh, the 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 effects of cyber war uh, in our environment. Uh, it's, all, it's already there. So thank you very much for bringing it up. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is time to uh, close our uh, discussions. Uh, uh, we had that question on SARC, but I, I just wanted to flag the point that we've had a regular session on SARC and there have been some takeaways. I also want to make the point that in, in discussions such as this, uh, all the uh, opinions and views raised on the table by the participants are obviously their own and BIPs has nothing to do with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, owning up uh, the the uh, these these views. They are, these are your views. Uh, I, I just want to say that um, I mean, uh, some takeaways from this particular discussion is that in, in, in a paradoxical way in international politics, I mean, it is more difficult uh, to be a friend than an enemy. I mean, the clear takeaway of today's deliberations is that South Asia, to allow its potential to find its fullest fruition, there are clearly uh, needs, uh, there's a need to reset the intramural uh, relations and the alternative, of course, as we have heard, would be too disastrous to contemplate. Now, um, in the quest to achieve uh, greater regional cooperation, uh, which will clearly, I mean, I, as I said, it's the motherhood statement, is clearly benefit all of us. Uh, the leading countries, the largest states, perhaps should lead the way. The others could then follow in what's called the flying geese paradigm. I mean, this is the economic model where less development economies in a region tend to follow those who are more affluent, like birds which fly in a triangular formation. Is this too tall an order? Perhaps not. 
as uh, Robert Browning, a poet who's very well known in South Asia as well, had said that man's reach should exceed his grasp. What else are the heavens for? I thank you all once again and BIPS for organizing this event. Thank you.